Hello and welcome to the interview with Gunnar Morling. Gunnar is the lead of the Debesium project and he will tell us a little bit about change data capture and other data patterns um, or data exchange patterns um, that we can use in a microservice environment, for example. And of course, about his uh, Debesium project, which in my opinion is very interesting. Gunnar. Thanks a lot for agreeing to the interview. For everyone who doesn't know you, could you please introduce yourself real quick? Um, you are muted. Hi, Torben. Thank you so much for me. That was a weird echo. Can you hear okay. me? Yeah, I can hear you fine. All right. Okay, so now it's good. Okay, so I still, yeah. hold on, I seem. Like, I just keep hearing myself. That's very weird. Um, okay, to me it sounds sounds good. All right, don't hear any echo. Try that. Okay, yeah, it seems better now. All right, okay. sorry about that. Um, I think I uh, had the live stream open, so I was hearing it myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm really um, glad to be here. Yeah, so I work as a software engineer at Red Hat, and as I said, I'm the lead of the Debesium project, and I'm really looking forward to telling you and the folks here what it is, what we can do with it, how it works, and yeah, every, everything you would like to know about it, right? Okay. <clears throat> Yeah, so since microservice has microservices has become uh, very popular, um, we are facing more and more challenges in, in sharing data between microservices. I mean, in the past, within a monolith, that wasn't an issue. Uh, we had one right. huge application with one database, and we just connected to the database, and all the data was available. There wasn't an issue with... Uh, exchanging data between different parts of our application or between different even separate services um, so since we now implement more and more microservices um, people start talking about data exchange patterns so mm -hmm. patterns uh, that provide us an easy way to share data basically um, change data capture or uh, short form cdc is one of these patterns. Um, can you explain what, what CDC is and uh, why we should use that in our applications? Right. So um, CDC, yeah, it's change data capture. And the idea is pretty pretty simple, real. So still the assumption is you have your data in a database, be it a relational database, such as MySQL or Postgres or SQL or, or whatever you're using, or something like MongoDB, some non no SQL database. So you have your data sitting there, and now you are interested in uh, whenever changes something to this data, right? So maybe a new customer record gets created, or an order gets updated, or something gets deleted. You would be interested to have an event about this change. So to change this event, it would describe what has happened, what's the record that has changed, and what, maybe what's the old state of this row, what's the new state of this row. And then you can uh, consume those events and, well, essentially do lots of interesting things with those events. So you were already touching a little bit on data exchange patterns between microservices. So that definitely would be one application of that. And I can tell you in more depth about it. But um, there are many other use cases which might be even more apparent or which might be more obvious. So first of all, you could use those change events just to implement some replication um, between databases, right? So you have your data. Maybe you have a production database there. Uh, and you have another database, which maybe your development team uses or maybe another team in your company uses and you would like to have the data from the production database also in this other database so you could use these uh, CC events to stream changes from this one database to another database and um, one interesting aspect about this is that this works across vendor boundaries right so maybe you have some replication tools which would work with your database from one postgres node to another that's fine but such as cc pipeline this is a bit more abstracted so we can replicate data ac across vendor boundaries so you might have a commercially licensed database running in production and maybe stream changes and have a data a, re a replicated version of this data on a freely available open source database in your development environment so that's one use case you could use those change events for implementing 
you know, full text search, right? Very often people would like to have full text search on their data and they don't feel the capabilities of my RDBMS are sufficient for that. I would like to use something like um, Elasticsearch or Solar for that. And of course you need to keep the index, this full text search index in sync with this data in your um, um, database, right? And again, such a CPC pipeline is um, one way to get the data from your database to the search index. You could use it to uh, update caches or invalidate caches. Um, one thing I really like is um, streaming queries. So this is a rather new notion where in the past, you, whenever you would like to query for data, you would essentially run this query on demand whenever you felt like this, whereas with such a streaming or a continuous query, this essentially runs when you know whenever something in the underlying data changes. So let's say you're interested in the aggregated order revenue of your business application. So whenever a new entry in this purchase order tables arrives, you could use CDC to trigger this streaming query and get this updated revenue value automatically for you in near real time. So that's just some of the use cases. There's many more, but I hope you know there's like the possibilities already. Um, there are many of them, right? Yeah, so it seems to be a very flexible approach to basically connect different systems based on data that changed in some place. Right. Um, so Debezium implements these patterns. Um, how does that how does that work? Um, which which components do I need, and and how does Debezium um, detect the changes and then share them with other applications. All right. So, um, yeah, first of all, I mean, there's different ways you could get change events out of the database, right? You could think about something like implementing triggers and you could then fire those triggers, uh, use those triggers to fire events somewhere else. But this would be in the transaction execution path. So there might be an, um, a performance overhead there. It also just is very, um, you know, um, impacts your schema, so you might not want to do that. You might think about polling, so you could go to your database and regularly ask, hey, is there a new entry or is there an updated entry in this table or in that table? But this, um, again, I mean, there you have a kind of an conflict of interest, so you would like to do this very often, so chances are high, so you get the latest changes. But then the more often you do this, um, the higher the load in the database will be, right? And at some point, your DBA might come and say, oh, please don't run this query on this table all the time. Don't do it. Uh, and then still, how, no matter how often you poll, you still might miss updates between two polling attempts, right? So this is just something you cannot exclude by definition. So this is also not the way to go. And the way the log-based CDC works, and this is what the BZM is doing, is that we essentially tap into the transaction logs of the database. So all those databases, they have append-only log files, which essentially are used for transaction recovery and also replication purposes. And this really is the source of all the changes to the database um, applies. So whenever something changes in the database, something gets added, updated, or deleted, there will be an, ev an event added to this transaction log. And this is also the canonical order of changes as transactions are serialized. So this is the source of truth. And by going to this transaction log, we have the canonical change stream of events from, from this database. And now the challenge there is there's no one way or one format how we could get to change events out of the database. So there's no one common standardized API which we could use. Um, instead, it's different. So there's one way and format to get change events from MySQL. So there's what's called the bin log in, in Postgres is the, um, the write ahead log, which is differently structured and which gives you a different way to get changes out of that. It's yet again for different for SQL Server, for MongoDB, and so on. Uh, but the good news is you don't have to deal with that as a user because this is where Debezium comes in. So we essentially did this um, exploration, we implement those different ways to get change events, and then we produce one rather abstract, one rather generic representation of change events. And since you asked how does or how do those events come to other um, consumers? So this is where Apache Kafka comes in. So currently, um, the Beesum is essentially based on Apache Kafka, and this is the broker, the messaging broker, which sits in the middle between Debezium as a producer of change events and then potent potentially other consumers. 
Um, there's one more notion, which is uh, Kafka Connect. And Kafka Connect is also a project from the Kafka, Apache Kafka umbrella. And this essentially is a framework and a runtime for implementing those kinds, um, those kind of connectors. And you have source connectors and sync connectors. And essentially, Debezium is a set of source connectors, so they get data into Apache Kafka, and then you have sync connectors, which get data out of Kafka topic to stream them somewhere else. And the nice thing about this is that you can set up those pipelines using those connectors in just by means of configuration. So you don't have to program anything. You just configure an instance of the Debezium connector, or you configure an instance of that sync connector, which might write data to Hadoop or whatever you would like to use as a sync. And then you have this CDC pipeline, which works from end to end without any coding involved. So as long as the, the databases are supported, I basically just provide us a, a piece of configuration, and the rest of it is handled by, by the Divisium, right? Right, exactly. So that's the idea. So you can configure it. You can say, please, I mean, sure, config, um, get change events from that particular database, but then also just you know whitelist those three out of 10 tables, perhaps, or maybe exclude a couple of columns. Maybe you have like a password column, which you would not like to see in change events, so you can exclude that. You can do things like snapshotting. So very often, if you start a connector and this database has been running for some time, you won't have the transaction logs from, you know, from the beginning of time. So um, what the connector can option optionally do for you is to take a snapshot. So this means it just gets the current state of the tables you're interested in. It essentially produces like a create event, sends this to Kafka. And then once the snapshot is completed, um, we will go to the log reading mode and continue to read the transaction log from, from that point. So there's yeah, many options like that. OK, interesting. And the main reason to, to read the logs is that it doesn't affect the performance of your database, right? Right. So, I mean, there's exactly so it's low overhead. It's also it's guaranteed you have the correct order of change events. So, if you think again, um, so uh, I mean, you could also, for instance, you could think about having your application write to your database and then maybe write to another system like Elasticsearch, right, to update the search index there. So, um, it would do those two writes, but then you might have an issue with the order of changes. Um, this might not be guaranteed to be the same uh, across those two systems. Whereas this is um, the order of changes is guaranteed in the transaction log. So, that's the one order the database has applied events in and if you get events from there we will just make sure that events are produced in that particular order if you send them to other systems so there's ordering there's this matter of completeness so if you think again about this polling um so there might be updates which happen between two polling attempts so you would essentially just see the last update which happened last before your second polling attempt um, if you go to the transaction log, we will see all those updates, right? Because they are all in the transaction log. And uh, one other thing is um, we also can see uh, deletes, right? So if you delete a record and you do something like polling, well, you would just not see this record. So you would not have a way you would not have a way to find out about this record. Whereas the delete will also be an entry in this transaction log, so we can capture it. And depending on the database and its configuration, we also might be able to see the old state of this deleted. So there's really many advantages of doing log based to yeah. see. Yeah, so so we can be really sure that that we are not missing anything and that we can keep all systems in sync exactly. uh, completely independent of what happens in our database. Um, Exactly right. So there's also, um, I mean, very often, I mean, so if you think about distributed systems and microservices, you need to think about resiliency, right? So what happens if one other system is not available? What should I do there? And this uh, one nice thing about such a CTC pipeline based on something like Kafka is that this all is essentially eventually consistent. So this means if, for instance, the Debezium connector is uh, not running for some time, maybe you install a new version of the connector, you upgraded it. Well, then, of course, the database it will re still receive changes, right? So during that time, we would not produce or we would not capture those change events and send them to Kafka. But then when Debezium is restarted, the new version is running, we just would continue to read the log from where we left off before. So internally, it's memorized um, how far have we read the log. And then we would continue to read from there. So this means you will not lose any event also if any of those components isn't running. OK. Yeah, during the, the my last conference at the, at the JAX, um, I gave a talk about, right, about data exchange patterns, basically. And there I also okay. talked about uh, change data capture. And the question that I 
got multiple times was why don't we write the data uh, to our database and to Kafka? So basically, mm -hmm. why do we need the additional service in between? Um, and well, I recognize that that is something that might be hard to grasp in the beginning. Um, yeah. What do you tell developers who are, who are thinking about writing to both systems? Yeah, so I'm telling them, don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> and th the reason is this. So there is um, no one shared transactional context around those resources, right? So maybe yeah. uh, people are aware of something like um, um, XA transactions and global distributed transactions. There's just no way we could have this for um, a database and something like Apache Kafka or something like Elasticsearch because we don't have any sorts of XA connectors for those resources. So what it means is um, you're just not guaranteed that your changes are consistently applied to all those resources. So it might happen, you apply the change to the database, and then for whatever reason, you cannot write the change to Apache Kafka, maybe you have a network split or whatever, well, then this change gets lost. And this obviously puts you into a very bad position because you already have altered the data in the database. Now you need to think about what should I do? Should I try to undo that? But maybe you already have, ta action, you have taken action based on this data. Uh, maybe you have sent off some emails, so maybe you cannot undo it. Or, so then you try and redo this change to Kafka, you try, you know, re you keep retrying, but for how long would you keep doing that? Um, maybe is, is think about some sort of nightly batch or whatever to get the systems back in, in consistent state. But really, it's like a very complex thing to do, and it's just not desirable. So that's yeah. what I keep telling people. Just don't try to write to multiple resources without transactional one shared transactional context, because it's essentially guaranteed that you will end up with inconsistent data. Yeah. Uh, especially because it's relatively easy to avoid by, by using a concept like change data capture. I mean, sure, it, it increases the complexity. I add additional services and, and all that stuff. Um, but yeah. in my experience, it's much mm -hmm. easier than handling all these corner cases and pitfalls um, exactly. myself. So. Um, yeah, I mean, it, uh, yeah, it, it adds a bit complexity in terms of your need. Yeah, you would need something like Debezium, but to be honest, I don't think it's too complex. And really, you just get the guaranteed consistency out of this. And also, I'm arguing, so even if there was an XA connector for Kafka and you could actually have a shared transaction across your database and Kafka, I still would recommend not to do it because it impacts the availability of your service. So this means exactly. um, now it's bound to the availability of your database and Kafka, right? But very often we just use Kafka to stream changes or stream events to other resources and we just don't need synchronous data access there. It doesn't matter does this other service synchronously see this particular change. It, it's fine if this is eventually consistent maybe in a very short amount of time, right? Whereas yeah. with CDC and this change, um, this log-based approach of getting changes from a database, your service will just be bound to its own database. And I mean, frankly speaking, if it cannot write to its database, probably it cannot do anything at all, right? So that's why I think just um, just requiring the database and then using CTC to asynchronously write changes to other events through Kafka, that's, for me, that's like like the sweet spot of things to do. Yeah, I, com I completely agree with you. Um, if you want to have the, the flexibil flexibility and the right, basically all the benefits of um, microservice or any other um, multi-service uh, architecture type, um, then things like CDC are the way to go. Um, I mean, you have to handle the, the additional complexity anyways. Um, and then CDC and tools like Debezium are just a comfortable solution. All right. Um, so a few minutes ago, you said that these logs that you pass with Debezium um, are mm -hmm. different for all databases. So there is no, no standardized format or anything. Right. Um, so which kind of databases do you support? Right. So currently, um, there's support for MySQL, Postgres, and MongoDB, and SQL Server. So that's uh, those four we are consider 
stable and, and, and mature and they are used pretty much uh, or they're used um, pretty often in production um, so I know about uh, large installations of Debezium where they use it to stream changes out of I think 600 MySQL databases at one customer so it's wow. it's seeing huge database installations where it's used uh, we have one more connector this is Oracle um, there this is currently incubating and um, yeah so it, it's under development and we will see how we how far we get there because um, yeah it's not very easy let's say to get change events out of, out of Oracle. okay but you're at least working on it so we, we can have some hope that we will get something or yeah i mean so there's a there's in connector which already exists we consider it incubating the thing there is you yeah. need to have a license for the golden gate product in order to use it because there's an api which we use which is called extreme and extreme uh it's not part of the oracle license so it comes it requires this golden gate license to use this connector some people are doing that we are exploring some more licensing friendly alternatives uh, some member actually of the community is working on this and we will see um yeah how, how this goes okay um so i saw that that the current version of debezium is uh, number 0 0.9 um, right. and you Shorty touched on that topic already, but um, I want to ask explicitly about it. Um, is it ready for production, or should oh, I yes. just use it internally for now and, and wait a little bit longer? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, about the version. Don't be scared of this um, zero um, dot something version. It's just like that for historical reasons, um, and we are yeah going to a one dot version very soon the thing is um this is already used in production at lots of companies um i know it from the chat i know it from other talks i know it from people coming to our user groups uh, or coming uh, to, uh, to our google group or you know approaching me to conferences so this is heavily used and being aware of this we are very careful when it comes to changes. I mean, so dbism itself it doesn't have any kind of api right it's not like a library um you would use i mean there's a way of using it as library but that's not what most people do really our our api essentially is the structure of the messages which we produce and maybe also like the configuration surface so you all those options that's like our public user interface right and we are very um very strict and conservative um uh, about changing this so we never we try to never break things there so what we are currently doing so um after 0.9 surprisingly there will be 0.10 not 1.0 <laughs> so we are working on an 0.10 and this is actually a little bit of a cleanup version so what we are currently working on is to remove some deprecated features so we had a couple of deprecated features um like removing some options and, and stuff like that and again being very careful about not breaking changes we did not remove them back then but we just deprecated them and we added new things and now we feel okay it's actually time to get rid of those deprecated things and make a clean slate so migrating here needs a little bit more caution than it will would usually do but um we are documenting those things very clearly in a um in a migration guide for each release so there's nothing to be concerned about and we are actually doing this in order to be prepared for going to 1.0 soon thereafter the idea being we don't want to have those deprecated things you know remaining in the 1.0 version yeah it makes sense um but yeah as you said um even so it's just version 0 0.9 it's it's already used in production right absolutely yeah if if someone decides that this is a good approach for their kind of application architecture um yeah. then they shouldn't worry too much about it and, and basically no, just give it a try definitely 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 not i mean it's just different ways of versioning stuff um maybe yeah. we i would not have started with this o.x version but i mean it's there now so um it's, it's fine and it's just um i mean so we still try to stick to you know like a semantic kind of version so if, if we add like a bug fix uh, let's say 0.9.1.2 those really will be like drop in releases which um just fix a few bugs maybe if we go then from 0.9 to 0.10 some things will change there will be new functionality um but yeah this all is um, we are pretty pretty much focused on not breaking things there because we just know people are relying on it yeah sounds good Okay, so I think we are about to wrap up the interview and go to 
answer a few questions. Um, so everyone in the chat, if you'd like to ask Gunnar anything about Debezium or change data capture, please post it in the chat now. Um, and Gunnar, if you could maybe summarize Debezium and for which it should be used in, let's say, two or three sentences, really short. <laughs> okay. um, so to someone who might have joined the the stream later um, and missed something at the beginning. What what is the the key benefit the, of Debezium and change data the, capture? The elevator pitch, right? <laughs> yeah, the elevator pitch. <laughs> okay, so yeah, so it's uh, a platform for log based change data capturing. So it means it gets change events out of your database, such as MySQL, Postgres, and so on. Whenever something changes there, gets updated gets created, gets deleted, we will have a change event. Those change events describe this change, like the old and the new state in case of an update. They will be streamed um, to consumers through Apache Kafka. And it enables interesting use cases, such as updating your search index based on those change events, invalidating caches, exchanging data between microservices, running streaming queries, uh, queries updating read models in a CQRS, um, architecture and many things more. Okay. So if one of the viewers decides to, to give Debezium a try, where mm -hmm. should she or he go to learn more about it? Yeah, absolutely. So they should just come to debezium.io. So that's our website. Um, and we have all the resources there. So we have um, a Google group um, for getting help. We have uh, chat rooms for getting help. This is all linked on the homepage. Um, there's a list with resources, um, so which um, you know contains links to blog posts, previous uh, conference talks. We have a big um, repo with examples. So by the way, of course, it's all open source, right? So this is all Apache licensed. Um, so all the code is on GitHub, but we also have an example repo. So there's lots of interesting demos, examples, which you can use uh, to see how things work with Demesium. And um, yeah, generally, uh, just come to the community, and we are happy to interact and in engage. And by the way, speaking of community, this is also something I'm really happy about. Um, so um, by now, more than 100 people have contributed to the museum, so it's quite quite a big number of people, and it's really great to see how you know what we can achieve if people come together and work on this joint um, goal of having this open source platform. Yeah, and I think the museum is a good example on uh, how how software development has changed and how open source uh, plays plays. Well, very important role uh, for for quite some time now, um, with innovative, interesting uh, new tools that solve real world issues. I mean, um, that's something that so exchanging data is something that we have to um, change and improve on right now. And uh, Debezium is definitely an interesting tool to to do that. Thanks um, so, much. <laughs> so it seems like we already touched all the all the interesting points for the interview and right now nobody seems to, to have additional questions about okay. Debezium. Um, so yeah, thanks for for doing the interview and, and sharing Absolutely. lots of interesting things about uh, Debezium. Um, if someone has a question and, and wants to get in touch with you directly, um, how, how can yeah, he, he or she do that? Uh, pop, yeah, just come to the chat. So go to the website. There on the on the footer, you have to link to the chat room, and that's really the easiest way. So there's some um, developers. Actually, we now have an engineer from the US, so we even have people working in different time zones. Um, so just come to the chat, and you will find someone who can discuss any kinds of questions you might have around the museum. Awesome. Okay. So gonna again. Thanks a lot. And um, I'm looking forward to, to see and hear even more about Debezium in the near future. All right, Tobin, thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure. And um, yeah, let's hope we see you sometime soon, right? <laughs> thank you. Yeah.